it is a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, and I know that Julie Bishop, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, would have been delighted to be with you today. But uh, as you conveyed already, Julie does send her apologies. Uh, but it's indeed a pleasure for me to be back here in front of CETA, an organisation committed to searching for the best policy ideas to develop our economy. And that is certainly a cause uh, that's close to my heart. Uh, the topic of today's panel discussion is conflict and trade and its implications for Australia. Now, there are a few topics of more relevance in my role as the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Foreign Affairs and as Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Trade Investment. And today, I intend to speak about the links between peace and prosperity, the importance of open markets, as well as free trade when it comes to global stability. Now, it's a statement of the obvious that any conflict, whether it's sub-national or between states, does come, of course, at a price. Conflict reverses development gains and trade arrangements that take years, if not decades, to recover. And sometimes they never do. It is, of course, a two-way street. Those plagued by fragility and conflict cannot fully participate in nor benefit from trade and economic growth. One of the defining features of this government has been placing economic diplomacy at the forefront of Australia's international engagement. Simply defined, it's the goal of traditional diplomacy is peace, then the goal of economic diplomacy is prosperity. Now, it does not mean that Australian diplomacy has dispensed with peace. Peace and prosperity rather go hand in hand. Prosperity is underpinned by stability. The reward for stable countries and regions is increased trade and greater growth. And there's been debate for many years about whether intertwined economies improve the prospects for peace. Now, it's probably impossible to find simple empirical proof for that idea, because the deeper truth is that the causes of conflict are many and always complex. Unfortunately, the globe is littered with countries and conflicts where, for one reason or another, economic relationships have not proven an inoculation against war. Nevertheless, I believe higher levels of trade and economic integration increase the cost and therefore reduce the chance of conflict. To put it another way, countries that trade together typically stay together. Now it's also safe to say that the great majority of the world's poorest people live in countries where conflict is rife. Now the World Bank estimates that in 2013, more than a billion people live in places that are affected by conflict and violence and of course, most of these, the most prevalent, are in war-torn parts of Africa. In these areas, extreme poverty, simply defined as living on little more than a dollar a day, is high. And economic growth is, of course, disturbingly low. Numbers and opinions vary. But the Brookings Institute has estimated that by 2030, more than 90% of the world's extreme poor will live in fragile, and conflicted affected states. That's 90%. And if we want to lift people out of poverty, and Australia takes this responsibility very seriously, the international community must find ways to address the problems that plague the world's trouble spots. Now, as a government, we're convinced that part of the solution lay in promoting trade, encouraging growth, attracting investment, and supporting business. Those are the foundations of economic diplomacy that do provide a pathway to prosperity. Take, for example, Syria. Since 2011, Syria has been crippled by a brutal civil war, which has killed an estimated 220,000 people, many of them innocent civilians, and resulted in millions fleeing to neighbouring countries and beyond in search of refuge. The human cost of this conflict has been immense. But consider for a moment the economic impact that wave after wave of violence in Syria has had, not only on the country, but also on the region. The violence in Syria has destroyed sophisticated trade and economic networks, as well as the supply chains that were built up over many years. The closing of borders, the cuts to exports, the destruction of factories and warehouses, and the subsequent loss of jobs has devastated the economy. Why is this so crucial? 
because those millions of displaced Syrians need more than just an end to violence if they're going to reconstruct their lives. They need livelihoods to be able to go back to. Rebuilding the economy, creating jobs, building business opportunities is by no means the only answer. It is, however, the foundation upon which a peaceful and stable society can be reconstructed. Now, ignoring the economic dimension of any plan for long-term recovery is a recipe for continued instability. Now, for its part, Australia has built its wealth and prosperity on the back of international trade and investment, underpinned by the long regional peace that we've enjoyed. We're a top 20 economy, we welcome foreign investment, and we certainly encourage trade. Indeed, our successes, the world's fifth highest per capita GDP, 12th largest economy, and a quality of life that is the envy of most of the world, have been built on the back of promoting opportunities for trade, attracting investment, and supporting the growth of Australian business. Australia's trade with the world is equivalent to 42% of our GDP. Our economy is open and diverse, our private sector is outward looking, and we're committed to continuous economic reform across the political class. We're open for business, and we are and will continue to be a welcome recipient of foreign investment. The stock of foreign investment in Australia is some $2.8 trillion, while Australia's investments around the world total nearly $2 trillion. Foreign investors in particular are attracted to Australia's political and economic stability, as well as, of course, our predictability. Now, it may be hard to lay out a direct causal relationship. However, our long history of political stability is underpinned by our economic history of prosperity. And I have no doubt that our stability reinforces peace throughout our region. In the years ahead, Australia is not at the position where we can rest on our laurels. Our prosperity is interlinked. It's interlinked with developments in the global economy, and we certainly have a very strong stake in the stability of the global trading and financial system. And this is particularly the case in our region. A more prosperous Indo-Pacific region, where the benefits of global wealth are spread broadly, helps to create stability and, of course, security. As the global centre of geostrategic and economic gravity shifts to our region, Australia has been quick to respond. And a central part of our economic diplomacy strategy has been to pursue free trade agreements, that is FTAs, with the biggest economies in our region. Our FTAs with Korea and Japan give Australian businesses the best treatment these countries have provided to any trade partner, giving Australian exporters, service providers and investors preferential access to what are key markets. And the benefits are already flowing. Japanese and Korean cars, for example, are cheaper. Farmers are exploring new export prospects. And Australian firms, keen to expand their presence further in the region, are certainly scoping out new opportunities. The China-Australia FTA, or chapter as it's called, will of course add to these opportunities when, as expected, it comes into force later this year. CHAFTA promises to unlock new opportunities for Australia in China, already our largest export market for both goods and services, and a fast-growing source of foreign investment for Australia. Few of our competitors have this level of access. And this suite of high-quality FTAs is a major achievement for Australia. The coalition, however, is doing more than just tying Australia to the economies of North Asia. The coalition government is negotiating a bilateral agreement with the emerging economic powerhouse that is India. And Australia is, of course, a key player in the two mega-regional FTAs that are currently being negotiated. That is, of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. Now, the TPP, set to become the world's largest FTA, is in the final stages of negotiations. It will bring together countries generating more than 36% of global output and, in creating common and transparent trade investment rules, provide new opportunities for Australian businesses in the fast-growing Indo-Pacific region. 
The TPP will expand Australia's economic footprint, creating new opportunities in countries with which we currently do not have FTAs, including, for example, Canada, Mexico and Peru, and build further on those agreements that we already have in place with Japan, the US, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei and Singapore. Australia is also working with China and India to create new trade and investment opportunities in Asia through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, as I said, negotiations. Now, the numbers here really are quite, quite staggering. The 16 countries involved in RCEP account for almost half of the world's population, nearly 30% of global GDP, and more than 70% of Australia's exports and 16% of Australia's two-way foreign investment. Now, RCEP is an initiative of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, and ASEAN is one of the region's greatest success stories. It's transformed Southeast Asia from a region of strategic conflict into one of remarkable cooperation and consensus. The result, stability. Peace and prosperity going hand in hand once again, including China and India, Developing Asia's GDP grew almost 19-fold between 1980 and 2014. Now, over the same period, the world economy grew less than six times. And GDP of developed economies increased by less than five times. So this is certainly no accident. ASEAN has greatly accelerated economic growth in the region by fostering deeper economic and political links. And ASEAN countries are, all, are on the cusp of creating the ASEAN Economic Opportunity, which aims to integrate the economies of Southeast Asia. Now, the creation of a single market in Southeast Asia and the free flow of goods, services, investments, capital and labour is an ambitious commitment that has the potential to further transform our region. Businesses engaged in the region will be well placed to take advantage both of its immediate benefits and those that promise to emerge over the longer term. Now, this is all good news. And despite this good news, there are, of course, some risks to Asia's uninterrupted growth story. Consider the South China Sea, a disputed maritime zone through which almost one third of the world's crude oil and most of Australia's merchandise trade travels. Now, clearly, Anything which interrupts seaborne trade through the South China Sea could have major implications for our region. There are also a number of unresolved issues and potential flashpoints that pose significant risk to regional security. North Korea's nuclear and missile programs and its proliferation of sensitive technologies are a threat to international peace and security. In the last three years, the North has successfully launched a long-range rocket, conducted its third and largest nuclear test, expanded nuclear fuel production, tested over 100 rockets without warning ships or aircraft, and threatened to use nuclear weapons. This is not happening far away. A false move by North Koreans could have a devastating impact on our economy. The capitals of our three largest export markets all lie within 1,300 kilometres of Pyongyang. <coughs> Conflict in Kashmir and insurgencies in a number of the region's developing countries also pose, to varying degrees, threats to our regional security. The impact, in, the impact on Australia, or indeed the world, if a war broke out in one of our major export markets is certainly difficult to contemplate. Happily, this is a what-if scenario and not a what now scenario. And Australia is doing everything in its power to ensure it remains thus. Each of us has a stake in making sure that events in the region do not reach the point where they pose a risk to trade or to the stability of the region. And Australia's prosperity and the future prosperity of our entire nation depends on it. Thank you very much.